about to leave already packing come with me i'm not really asking we'll get away to a place where we don't know about to see the world in action what we can be life with no distractions we'll get away this is what we waited for everyone it's Jim here at Cheetah Do HQ welcoming you to our latest uh, I think it's our 16th live A-level economics revision blast and I'm joined today by well as I look at the screen Penny top right uh, Vicky bottom left and Henry bottom right that might look different depending on how you're looking at the screen um, and it's behavioral economics tonight and uh, I was just looking at the the, the the YouTube stats there's lots of people are coming into the chat window as we speak and amazingly we're Closing in on 50,000 A-Level Economic students who've either attended the live sessions uh, on our series or who've watched on replay. So if you're watching wow. on replay, amazing numbers, Cathy, isn't it? If you're watching on replay, yeah, good, mo good morning or good afternoon or good <laughs> evening. Um, so it's fantastic to see uh, the chat window, of course, we use for our live participants. So if you're with us now live, fantastic. Use that to type your answers in. Of course, if you're watching on replay, you get the chance to pause the video and give yourself some extra time, which might be useful today because uh, Penny, Kathy, Henry, I think there's some challenging questions in this in this session. Yeah, yeah, really. yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So I think no no time to waste. Shall we get straight into the first set of activities, which I think are some warm up MCQs? There are, and those are mine. So are we ready to go? So we've got three multiple choice questions to start off with. So the first one, traditional economic theory has the key assumptions that economic agents are. Is it altruistic, boundedly rational, satisfies or rational utility maximizers? So please do use the chat. Please get, get your 
answers onto the chat and then we can see what you are thinking. So I can see some answers coming in already. I've got some A's, I've got some D's, quite a lot of D's coming in now. Somebody's just correcting themselves there, having put the wrong answer first time round. Excellent. Well, it looks as though we're just about there. Jim, do you want to reveal the first answer for us? And of course, it is D. So traditional economic theory has this key assumption that people are rational utility maximizers. And it's really quite important to think about what uh, rationality means in this sense. So it means that our economic agents have got really well-defined preferences. They know what they like and they're really good at using all the information available to make what are called unbiased choices. So they can be wrong, they can be wrong, but they won't be systematically wrong. They won't make repeated errors. Right, Jim, can we move on to question number two then? What name is sometimes used to refer to a rational economic agent? Is it Ceteris Paribus, Homo economicus, Adam Smithite, that one made me laugh, or Homo sapien? Which of this do you think it is? Let's have your answers on the chat as soon as you think you know. Lots of bees coming in. Let's see whether anyone's going to disagree with that. At the moment, everybody's thinking it's B. Yes, yeah, somebody's saying they wish it was C. No, I agree. That would be that would be very funny, wouldn't it? But everybody seems to think it is B. Right, Jim, could you give us the answer, please? And of course, it is B. Really quite a sort of traditional term used here. And when we're thinking about behavioural economics, and we can call our rational super beings econs, and sometimes we refer to people who are less rational or less rational some of the time as humans. So humans have got um, a limited or bounded cognitive ability and they're going to take shortcuts to try and cope with that. Right, Jim, can we have the third of our warm-up multiple choice questions? Um, which one of the following best describes loss-averse behaviour? Is it a consumer who values losses more than gains? A consumer who values losses and gains equally? A consumer who values gains more than losses? Or a consumer who values gains disproportionately more than losses? Let's have all oh, some differences of opinion coming in on the chat. I've got some A's. I've got some D's. Just give you a few more moments. Nobody seems to think B or C. It's between A and D. Right, that looks like that's all the answers we're going to get. Okay, Jim, do you want to share the correct answer with us? And it is a. So loss averse behavior is when a consumer values losses more than gains. And um, research suggests this can be really quite a dramatic difference with some people uh, valuing losses twice as much as gains. So the financial area gives lots of good examples here. So what we're talking about here with loss aversion is you would feel far worse about losing £20 than you would about finding or winning £20. And this Fear of incurring a loss can have really quite big 
impacts. It can stop people taking even really quite well calculated risks when there's, there's a worthwhile return. And it's really closely linked to status quo bias and default choice. So people like a default choice because they don't feel quite so responsible if it's gone wrong. Right, that's it from me for now. So I'm going to hand over to Henry for some confusing pairs. Good evening, everybody. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at different ways that people's behaviour can be nudged in certain ways. And um, what we're going to do is we have a definition of a term and we have two options. So we have two options on the left, default choice and mandated choice. And we have two definitions on the right. The option that a consumer selects if they do nothing wrong, uh, sorry, if they do nothing, and when people are required by law to make a choice. If the one on the left matches up to the one on the right, just put a yes in the chat. If it doesn't, put a no. So do these terms and definitions match up? Getting a few answers coming through. Great, and it seems like everyone's in agreement here. Everything is matched up correctly here. Um, the default choice is the choice that happens if you do nothing. And what we call, uh, and this leads to what we call default bias. The idea that consumers and all agents often just go for what is already there. Um, for example, if they're uh, topping up your amount and donating the rest of your change to charity and you have to untick the box in order to avoid that, often you just end up not bothering and you might donate more to charity. Or sometimes some of the ideas around uh, consent for organs, you might presume consent. Whereas mandated choice is just making it illegal to not go that way. So that's just a way of forcing people to make a certain choice. Can we have the next slide, please? So two more here, we've got availability bias, availability bias, and we have confirmation bias. Two definitions, occurs when people seek out or evaluate information in a way that fits with their existing thinking and preconceptions. And another one which says, when people judge the likelihood of an event or the frequency of its occurrence by the ease with which examples come to mind, do they match up? Okay, a few answers come in. See if everyone, give everyone a bit more time, a bit longer, these definitions. Fantastic. And it seems like everyone is happy that these need to be switched around. Confirmation bias occurs when people seek out or evaluate information in a way that fits with their existing thinking and preconceptions. Example of that would be having a belief that for example a certain vaccine may not work so you might go out of your way and only really accept stats that support that because it already comes to what you already understand and availability bias is when you judge the likelihood of an event by seeing which examples come to mind the easiest so when you have a lot of anecdotes that sort of support a particular idea rather than looking at objective data you might just leave, um, you might just think about anecdotes and say that that um, is going to be what your evidence is or your belief. So next slide, please. Final one that we have um, in terms of the confusing pairs is framing and priming. One of these is going to be when our behavior is influenced by cues that work subconsciously to choose in certain ways. And the other one is going to be the way in which a choice is described or presented. Do we switch them over? Or should I say, uh, are they correctly matched up? Are they correctly matched up? And again, everyone seems to be pretty happy that we need to swap these over. So priming being how um, our behavior is going to be influenced by cues that work subconsciously. For example, they might appeal to certain senses. Some people really like the smell of fried food and that might prime them towards buying more fast food. Uh, framing is going to be the way in which a choice is described or presented. For example, meat, when it's 25% fat, doesn't sound so appealing. When it's 75% lean meat, even though they logically mean the same thing. 
it sounds a lot more appealing when you say 75% lean meat. Music and shots is a great example of priming. Um, listening to the music makes you, for example, um, in a better mood and you might buy more things as a result of it. Fantastic. Um, and I believe I am passing, oh no, I'm not passing over. I'm no. sticking with it to the 60 second challenge. Um, and the 60 second challenge works like this. I'm gonna give you 60 seconds and you need to match up the terms on the left to the definitions on the right so rules of thumb anchoring availability bias one that we've just done social norms and habitual behavior have a read of the definitions on the right and match them up maybe you go a1 b2 c3 if they're already per uh, perfectly matched up 60 seconds put your answers in the chat off you go Okay, time's up. Can we get the answers, please? And a massive well done to Phoebe, who was the first one who managed to get all of the answers right. So rules of thumb, simple tools that help economic agents to make decisions. So rather than being that sort of utility maximizer where you're calculating the costs and benefits of every decision you ever make, you tend to just sort of follow certain rules. I know that buying certain foods is going to make me relatively happy. Therefore, while I may not be completely maximizing utility and thinking which food is going to make me the happiest, I'm following my rules of thumb. Anchoring. Anchoring being placing too much information on the first piece of information received. And this is often relevant when looking at prices. For example, when you're out to buy a washing machine and let's say the washing machine costs around £200. If the first one you saw costs £100, then it's going to look relatively expensive so that might mean that you're not going to buy it whereas if the first one you saw was 500 pounds you're anchored to that very high price and you're thinking 200 pounds bit of a bargain i'm going to go for it availability bias we've already gone through when people judge the likelihood of an event based on the ease with which examples come to mind social norms when day-to-day -day behavior in markets is influenced by prevailing social norms or social customs when you see everyone else doing the same thing you might act in a similar way habitual behavior when an individual follows a rigid pattern of behavior for example maybe in your weekly groceries you always buy the same thing so you're going to buy it regardless of whether it maximizes ut your utility on each occasion or not thank you very much and now i am passing on to penny thanks very much henry and hello to everybody okay the first qu question i've got for you here is one of the bubble quiz questions so you're going to be shown a question and four possible answers. The thing here is that it may be that none of those answers are correct. It could be that all four of them are correct or anything in between. So you have to decide. Let's have a look at the first one, Jim, please. So there's your question at the top. Which of these are examples of a habitual behavior? And you've got four to look at. And as I say, it may be none of these are habitual behavior. It may be that all four of them are, or one, or two, or three. Have a look through them, think about them, and start typing in the letters of the ones that you think are correct. Okay, there's a couple of answers coming in. Nobody's gone for more than two choices yet. OK, so we're pretty clear on B. There are a few people going for D's as well. Let's have a look at the correct answers, please, Jim. We have to have a bit of a consensus here. And it is just B and D, which are habitual behaviour. So buying the same breakfast cereal every week, that's a habit. 
and staying with the same broadband provider, even though you might get a better deal from another provider, is habitual behaviour as well. If we take a quick look at the other two, taking up smoking to fit in with a friendship group, that would probably be more like herd behaviour. Uh, and then the first quote influencing the idea of a fair price, that's very like um, what Henry was speaking about just a moment ago with the price of washing machines, so that would be anchoring. Okay, now you've got the idea for that. Let's have a look at a second bubble quiz question. And this time we've got which of these are government policies that utilise behavioural economic thinking? Again, you've got four to choose from and you have to choose which of these are definitely utilising behavioural economic thinking. Could be all four of them, could be none of them. OK, we're getting some differences this time. It's always nice to see. Yeah. Didn't the government have a nudge unit? Someone's saying there's a lot, lots of lots of you saying a lot of saying A and C and D. One or two of you saying all four of them. Jim, can we have a look at the correct answer, please? It's three of them. It is A and C and D. So well done. Lots of you did get that. Um, B in subsidies, yes, subsidies are a government policy, but not a behavioural policy. They were relying more on the, the um, incentive that's being given to suppliers by a subsidy being offered. But nothing's definitely using behavioural economic thinking. Default choice and negative framing, again, going back to some of those uh, ideas, those definitions of different types of behavioural economics that we've already looked at. Okay. Right, thank you. Now, we're going on now to what I think is the most complicated of the tasks that we've got for you in, in tonight's Revision Blast. You've got lots of information on the table in front of you there. There are, are 16 phrases altogether, and they fit into four groups of phrases. So if you know the connection wall game, you'll, you'll, you'll know what you need to do here. You need to look through the 16 and try and work out which what the four groups are and which four fit together. Um, some of them have to do with behavioural economics, but not necessarily all of them. So some of them might be there as a, as a bit of a sort of a, a, a distractor for you. I'll give you a, a little bit of time to start looking and see if you can work out one of the, uh, one of the groups and what four things might fit into that group. Let's see how you can get on. When you start think you start to have an idea, type it into the uh, the chat. Okay, we've got a couple of ideas starting to come through. That's good to see. Is anybody finding anything behavioural here? Let's just give you a few more seconds to think on that and see if you can see anything else that has four linked phrases. There's nothing wrong with the answers that have come through so far. Okay, let's give you the first group. Jim, can, can we look at the first group, please? So if we can look at the first, there you go. So the first group that we're picking out, these ones are behavioural. Um, so we've got examples of priming, okay? Labelling something as a premium product. Um, once something's been, once you've been told something is a premium product, are you going to be satisfied by going for something that which is, which is less than premium? Maybe not. Um, so that would maybe sort of nudge you towards going for that premium idea. And then subliminal cues in TV adverts. There's something clever that's being hinted at that, 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 that's just sort of giving us an idea in a TV advert. Coke and Pepsi have, have done some very uh, clever work on that. Um, wafting the smell of food through a shopping centre, food hall. Who hasn't been in a supermarket and smelt the fresh bread? cooking from, from the fresh bread counter and doesn't it make you want to go and buy some of it? Um, 
likewise if you go into a cinema very often the smell of popcorn is all pervasive and, and people need to go and buy a, a, a large tub of popcorn to take into the film with them and then students signing up to an honor code before sitting in exam and knowing that they've signed that maybe um, influences their behavior and the, and the way that they go about that exam okay so that, those four were examples of priming now supposing i was to tell you um, that the next set is object alternative objective Start, start again. Alternative objectives to profit maximization. Can you pick out the four that would that would fit that? One or two of you already have actually come up with those. Alternative objectives to profit maximization. Which four would you pick for that? What are you thinking? I know some of you uh, have already come up with these. There were a couple who came up with them very quickly. Uh, I think Rebecca was quickly onto this one. So were Emma and Julia and Phoebe. So let's put them up now, please, Jim, if we could see the next four. There you go. The one's up in here in green now. Alternative objectives to profit maximization. So we're looking at sales max. Um, we're looking at uh, profit satisficing or corporate social responsibility objectives or revenue maximization. So these not behavioral economics as such, but the, the, the um, objectives that will make a difference to the way that businesses behave in their, their pricing and their quantity decisions on your theory of the firm. OK, so the next one we're going to look at, look for is examples of social norms. So we're down to only eight to choose from now. See if you can pick out the ones which are examples of social norms, please. So which half, which four of those eight are going to be examples of social norms? OK, Emma's come up with a group of four. Very good. Let's have a look at them, please, Jim. Can we put up the examples of social norms? There they are, the ones in blue, buying a round of drinks at the pub. It's just what everybody does. It's what we're used to doing. It becomes normal behaviour, accepted behaviour. We don't question it. We just expect to do it. Likewise, stopping smoking, if none in your peer group smoke, would be much easier because it's the accepted behaviour around you. Queuing behaviour in the UK, definitely. You know, this is just sort of what we do, particularly at the moment. But, but you know, we, don't, we didn't need the pandemic to teach us how to queue. We knew how to do it already. And then the social pressure to pay taxes is an interesting one as, as well. And, and again, if we just expect to do it, we quite don't question it, we go ahead and do it. So, of course, this leaves us the last four. Can anyone tell me what is the link between the last four, the Ceteris Paribus, Maybe criticised for being unrealistic, used for simplification and used to isolate the effects of a change in one variable on another. What do you think is the uh, the, the link between those three, uh, those four even? OK, we've got a couple of suggestions coming through. So people going for things like key assumptions in traditional economic theory. Yes, in particular, if we have a look at the answer, that the, the, the um, link between them that we're going to give you now, please, Jim, is features of assumptions, particularly in economics. So we do assume Soteris Paribus, and that's a way we can evaluate very often by questioning whether a Soteris Paribus is going to hold or, or what happens when it, when it changes. Um, think about whether... A, a, theory is realistic or unrealistic when we see it working in practice. Um, we can isolate the effects of one change or changing one variable on another and, and assume that nothing else is changing. OK, well done. There was, as I said, I think those were some really quite tricky questions and there were some very good answers. So well done, everybody. I'm going to hand you back to Henry now. Hi, everyone. Um, so what 
we are going to do now is red herring. So what's going to come up is you are going to see four different options come up and without knowing what links the other three, there's going to be one odd one out. So you have to try and identify the odd one out and see if you can also, having identified the odd one, group the other three. So going to the next slide, please. What we have is behavioral economics experiments, limited time for decision making, imperfect information, and inability to process all the information. Which one is the odd one out and why? What is it that links the other three? So put your answers in the chat. What's the odd one out? And which one is gonna link the other three? Fantastic, we're getting a few answers for A. We've got Julia saying others are reasons for irrational behavior. All right, let's have a look at these, all the others that's been bounded rationality. Fantastic. So A is the odd one out because A is behavioral economics experiments and behavioral economics experiments give us reasons. They help to investigate reasons why people might act irrationally. So they are what yield us reasons, but the others are gonna give us, uh, the others are reasons that people act irrationally. For example, if you're under time pressure, you may not make the decision that best maximizes your utility. Remember rationality, in the economic sense means maximizing your utility. If you have imperfect information, you might not act in ways that maximize your utility and inability to process all the information. When you go into a supermarket, you can't possibly know out of all the possible options that you or things you could buy, which one is gonna maximize your utility. Your brain simply can't process it. So as a result, you're not able to act fully rationally in terms of making every decision to maximize your utility. So that a few times now. Can you get the next slide please? So once again, choose the odd one out and what is gonna link the other three. Volunteering, donating to charity, commitment to pay employees a fair wage and spending 20 pounds that you found on the street on yourself. So pick the odd one out and see if you can explain what the other three are. What is it about the other three? Okay, getting a few answers coming now. Give you a little bit longer. Fantastic, we're getting loads of great answers for D. D is in fact the correct answer. Spending 20 pounds that you found on the street on yourself is one of those sort of classic ideas. It's the homo economicus idea that all we care about is maximizing our own utility. So when I find 20 pounds, I wanna spend it on things that are gonna benefit me. Whereas the others are acting in ways that are altruistic, which are gonna be benefiting other people without any real benefit to yourself. Volunteering, donating to charity, when we come to firms and we talk about how firms act rationally, they'll be maximizing profit or committing to pay employees a fair wage rather than cutting their own costs isn't going to be maximizing prof uh, profit maximizing behavior for a firm. So that's going to be why that would be an example of altruistic behavior. Thank you very much. And I'll be passing on to Kathy. Yes, thanks very much, Henry. Um, I've got the last three activities of the evening and these are statement pairs. So what you have to do is to decide whether they are true or false, then select the letter that goes with the correct option. So here's the first one then. Discoveries from past behavioural experiments are all easily general, oh gosh, generalisable. That, that's gone wrong. You get the idea to the future. Statement number two, graduate psychology students volunteering for behavioural economics experiments is an example of self-selection. So are these statements true or are they false? So I can see Tutor to you on the chat saying these two statement questions can be tricky and they can, but we've got super keen students on the chat this evening, uh, all adding their answers. So we've got C's, we've got 
D's. Someone hedging their bet, C or D. Have a bit of a think and add what you think the answer is. I'm just going to give you a few moments more. Someone saying E, E, I'm pretty confident E is definitely wrong. Okay, not much evidence of her behaviour in the chat. No, indeed. All right, Jim, would you like to give us the correct answer, please? And the correct answer is, in fact, C. So if we look at statement one, discoveries from past behavioural experiments aren't very likely at all to be uh, something we can generalise to the future, especially in the social sciences. Too much changes. Now, statement number two is true. And it's not only true, but actually it's a really, really good example of self-selection. So a really key thing about behavioural economics is that statistical testing of what's going on is hugely important. So somebody in the chat earlier mentioned the nudge unit, the behavioural insights team, and they're phenomenally good at this. So what you don't want is what's called statistical sampling bias and self-selection where you let participants choose whether they're going to take part in your research. Um, it can really mean that your results are unreliable. Other things that can do this is if you pre-screen who's going to take part in your experiments. And you can also have something called participant attrition. So if you set up the experiment in a way that certain groups are more likely than others to drop out more quickly. Jim, can we have the second set of statement pairs then? So, statement number one, behavioural economics is sometimes criticised for experiments mainly involving rich, educated subjects from Western countries. Is this true or false? And statement two, people's behaviour in laboratory experiments are always realistic. So same thing again, decide which is true, which is false, um, and pick the letter that corresponds to your choice. So I can see, so people saying B, someone saying it has to be B. More people saying B. So let's see. Your answer's on the chat as soon as you think you know what it is. Seems to be a very sort of general consensus that it's B. Let's just see, give you a few seconds more and see if we get anything else in. Yes, someone's saying, absolutely right, be suspicious when there is a word like always. Yes, absolutely. Be suspicious when you see always or never. Okay, Jim, can we have the answer then, please? There we go. And the answer is B. So, statement one is true. Behavioural economics is sometimes criticised for this. But I think it's really interesting that there's quite a lot of work going on now in some of the developing areas of the world, um, looking at things like why would someone who doesn't have enough to eat buy a TV, for example. Uh, statement two is false. Um, as the chat is saying, always be wary when you see this word 
always. So people's behavior in laboratory experiments uh, may well not be that realistic at all. And these two statements here, they're, they're really sort of perfect evidence, actually, that you need to learn from your statistical experiments, your evidence in the right context. Jim, can we have the very last activity of all, please? It's our third statement pair. Statement one, behavioral economists believe bounded rationality leads individuals to satisfy when making decisions. And statement number two, the assumption that economic agents are rational may lead to government interventions having unintended consequences. Do you think these are true? Do you think these are false? Let's have your answers on the chat. Someone's hazarding a guess at A. Somebody else a little bit more confident. Let's see. Let's see. Let's give you just a little bit longer to get your final answer on the chat. Be really nice to see an answer from everyone. This is the very last question and we are almost, almost done. Almost done. Lots of people saying A, but not absolutely everybody. Oh, we've got a B now. Haven't seen anyone say D, so people are really quite unsure about this one. Okay, Jim, could we have the final answer then? The final answer is A. Both of these statements are true. So behavioural economists believe bounded rationality leads individuals to satisfy when making decisions. So their cognitive ability is, is bounded almost by the, the weight of information that they have to think about. So they'll adopt shortcuts or rules of thumb in order to make things easier for themselves. Technical word for these rules of thumb is heuristics. Uh, statement number two, yes, if you as a government assume that economic agents are rational and they are not, then your policies, your interventions could indeed have unintended consequences. Um, one of the key things in trying to get high marks in behavioural economics, and I know that will be what all of you are after, is to have a really good idea of the circumstances when economics um, agents are likely to experience bounded rationality. And we've talked about it a bit earlier, but it is so important. So it's likely to be when information is complex, when there's a lot of it and it's complex. When it's unfamiliar information or when there's real time pressure. So being able to spot circumstances when people are more likely to be irrational or circumstances where they may be predominantly rational lets you talk about the right sorts of things. Jim, we are done with the questions. Let me hand back to you wow. now. Fantastic. A whistle-stop tour through some really complex stuff on behavioural economics. So huge thanks to, to Penny and Cathy and Henry for leading us through it. Uh, that was great. Hopefully you found it useful. If you did enjoy it, don't forget to make our three presenters incredibly happy. Please give yeah. this live session <laughs> the thumbs up. Don't touch the thumbs down button. That's not allowed. Um, of course you can if you want. And also uh, to get an alert for all the upcoming A-level economic sessions, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. On Thursday at 5.30 p.m., uh, we have, uh, oh, it's Jeff, uh, Lisa, and 
Ollie yeah. doing fiscal policy. And I don't want to sort of prime you on this, but it's a premium session, yeah. is that? The, yeah. But the first... The first 20,000 live users will be allowed in free for the first 41 minutes. And, <laughs> and we're also going to be piping into that session some freshly, uh, the smell of freshly printed banknotes, which will be, I think, a first for our live sessions. Uh, just picking up some of the ideas that I've come up with from Henry and Penny and Kathy today for, for next Thursday's session. So hopefully you enjoy, hopefully you'll be with us again on Thursday. That was great, wasn't it? Great fun. That. It was good. It was good. Time. Tricky yeah, stuff. Fantastic. Yeah, tricky stuff, but the chat did well, yeah. didn't they? Uh, really as well. always, the, 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 well, our live yeah. chat students were on fire. If you're watching on replay, can you do better than they did? Well, you won't know because you won't be able to see the live chats, but I can tell you that they were spot on <laughs> and their answers yeah. were really, really strong, very quick. But hopefully you'll enjoy that session if you're watching on replay as well. Uh, yeah, some great feedback here in the chat window on that session. So we'll see you hopefully next later this week on Thursday at 5.30 and for subsequent sessions. We're going to be running lots more of these sessions next week and over Easter ahead of those crucial assessments for many of you beyond the Easter holidays. But for now, from me, from Jim and from Kathy, Penny and Henry, a huge thank you and uh, yeah. see you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.